Welcome back and today we're checking out another SCP video. This one was suggested by the viewers and today we're going to check out SCP-4999 Someone to Watch Over Us. Now I noticed this one is pretty short so we're going to do something a little bit different for this. We're going to do a back-to-back -back double header watching the same SCP from two different places. First we're going to start with SCP Explained and then check out the Vulgans take on the same thing. Kind of see uh, what they have um, in common. Kind of see what they tell a little bit differently. So let's go ahead and jump right into it and uh, see what someone to watch over us is. Some of the anomalies the SCP Foundation deals with are dangerous, with the most powerful able to end all life and even reality as we know it. Others pose no threat at all and seem content to simply exist. Big old Still eyeball. others are something else entirely. SCP-4999 is a humanoid entity, though its appearance seems to fluctuate between manifestations, with the only unchanging detail being that it always is dressed in dark formal wear. Originally okay. thought by many to be an urban legend, local tales of SCP-4999 are what initially tipped the Foundation off to its existence, and further research indicates that there are accounts that may be referring to the appearances of 4999 throughout recorded history. Oh. Strangest of all, though, is the consistency with which it appears, or rather, the consistent situations and types of people it appears to. From the data available, it seems that SCP-4999 only appears to people in a very specific type of need, as you'll see in the case of a subject named Alex Hereford and the fateful night he experienced. The road was slippery, and Alex was driving too fast. He knew this, of course, but it's a different matter altogether to know a thing and to care about it. Rain hammered on the front windshield, the weak headlights of his 2005 Honda Civic barely punching into the thick black night ahead of him. Winding through the mountainside, the road was mostly empty, save for the very occasional twin beams of light blazing past him due to his high speed. It was hard to hear the honking of angry horns over the heavy pounding of the rain. Then, it happened. In a way, Alex knew it was inevitable. His tread-worn wheels finally lost contact with the ground, thick layer of rainwater between them and asphalt betraying his speeding vehicle's grip on the road and sending it careening out of control. He had expected fear, but instead felt nothing really. A slight sense of anticipation, like wincing right before a punch lands in that childhood game of hitting each other on the arm. It wasn't that the world had slowed down, but perhaps his brain was simply working at a much greater velocity now, recognizing its own impending death. His speed of thought seemed magnified to the point of slowing his perception down. He heard of soldiers in war zones experiencing the same phenomenon, as they felt sure that in the next few seconds, they'd be dead. Alex wondered, would he smash into a tree, go off a cliff's edge? He could hardly see the forest or the terrain beyond in the thick rain and the dark of the mountain. Though he traveled this road a million times before, he had no idea where he actually was tonight. He supposed it wouldn't really matter, which it was. As usual, his thoughts turned to her, or rather, they had simply run their course and returned to the one place they always did. It wasn't like there were many other people to think about in Alex's mostly empty life. There was, and always had been, since the moment he'd met her, mostly just her. But even Alex's heightened state of mind couldn't delay the inevitable for long. It would be a cliff after all, Alex thought curiously, catching a glimpse of town lights far away and below. The car spun 180 degrees out into empty air, then came crashing down with a horrible roar of shattered glass and tearing metal as it tumbled down the hillside. Even over the torrential downpour, the noise of Alex's crash was significant, had anyone been around to hear it. Finally, after over a hundred feet down a steep incline, the car smashed into a single thick oak tree, bringing the disaster to an end. As if on cue, the rain began to let up, slowly at first. Then all of a sudden, in that peculiar way that northwest torrential downpours tend to do, as if the sky had at last finished emptying itself all at once. Inside the shattered vehicle, Alex was, incredibly, alive, at least for the time being. The airbag deployment had spared his face the worst of it, and the sturdy aluminum frame of the vehicle had given its all in protecting Alex's body from the downhill crash. But even postmodern vehicle engineering had its limits. His breath came in slow, ragged gasps, difficult at first, 
but gradually steadied. Not an improvement in his condition, but rather his body dedicating the rapidly dwindling resources at its disposal into keeping vital functions going as long as possible. Opening his eyes, Alex was surprised to find himself right side up, less surprised to look down at the shattered mess his limbs and lower body had become. Gradually, Alex's thoughts cleared, his sense of self returning after the bone-jarring drop down the steep incline and sudden stop at the end. Looking to his right, he could see the trunk of the tree that had stopped his out-of-control tumble. Despite himself, Alex laughed, a weak, gurgling chuckle. So, it was the cliff and a tree after all. He focused on breathing, <laughs> letting the waves of pain wash over him until his brain eventually canceled them out by injecting his broken body with adrenaline and chemicals. Everything was quiet and still after the crash and the rain, but to his surprise, he could hear something. It was faint at first, just a soft crunch of footsteps on gravel, but the sound grew louder and louder until at last, it came to a stop outside Alex's window. With every ounce of effort, Alex turned his head towards the sound. A rescuer? No, impossible. Nobody was up on this mountain, and nobody could possibly have reached him here so quickly, even if there had been. He supposed he should have been surprised, yet almost from the moment that his eyes fell on the tall, handsome figure with the casual yet fashionably cut black suit, Alex accepted him for what he was. There was no shock, no confusion. For the second time tonight, just a calm sense of acceptance. The man, probably somewhere in his mid-thirties, leaned down to peer in through the window. He said nothing as he casually observed the extent of Alex's injuries. Satisfied, he laid a hand on Alex's shoulder. The grip was firm, but not painfully so. Just strong enough to communicate, I am here with you. Things will be alright. After a slight squeeze, the figure reached inside his jacket and produced a pack of cigarettes packing the tobacco with swift taps against his palm before removing two cigarettes and offering one to Alex. Alex nodded his head, a very small motion that exploded pain across his shattered body. No, thank you, but that stuff will kill you. Alex smiled. The man paused for a moment, the ghost of a smile showing on his face for just a moment before disappearing. Returning the offered cigarette, the man took his own and lit it, giving Alex a good look at his face in the light of his cigarette lighter. Alex had been right. The man appeared to be somewhere in his mid to late thirties. Handsome, but not cover model, so just pleasing to the eyes. He sported short hair, carefully combed and perfectly neat, completely unaffected by the slight drizzle that still fell. The more Alex looked at him though, the less he could remember about the man's exact features. It wasn't that they changed in any way, but rather that he simply couldn't hold on to any details for more than a few seconds. I'm dying, aren't I? The figure didn't speak nor did it nod or make any form of verbal or bodily communication. He simply looked, and Alex understood. Alex had never been particularly religious or spiritual, but in that look, he understood that there was a world beyond, and one that he would very quickly be entering into. It was as if, for the first time in his life, he was able to probe that world. Okay, so this guy appears to be maybe a manifestation of death, but... I don't really think he's death per se. Hard to tell, but uh, but yeah, let's let's keep going. Reality peeling away just enough to glimpse what was beyond. Twisting paths through planes of shadow and light both. Shuffling figures along each, and at the very center of it all, a light? No, a feeling. Love, pulsing forth like the beating heart of it all. The saints had their angels, the wicked their demons, but everyone else in between the two, they had him, a guide, someone to watch over them on their final journey. Alex coughed, it was ending soon. The man took a drag from his cigarette and removed a handkerchief from another hidden pocket, carefully dabbing away the blood around Alex's chin, then returned to his silent smoking. His vision was beginning to dim around the edges, the noises of the forest growing more and more distant. Alex knew it wouldn't be long now, but he had just one final thing to do. As he always knew they would, his thoughts returned to her, here, at the end. Once more, he turned his head towards the passenger's side seat, pain exploding across his body with the motion. There, just on the far edge of the seat, as his phone, having miraculously survived the crash. It was no good though. Even if he'd been able to move his shattered right arm, 
He could never reach it with his fading strength. The smoking man took one final pull of his cigarette, putting it out on the side of the vehicle and pocketing the stub. Then he reached through the broken driver's side window, Alex catching a slight whiff of cigarette smoke blended with an unrecognizable but pleasant cologne. The man reached across Alex and grabbed the phone, pulling back and looking down at Alex's shattered right hand. After a moment, he reached down once more and put the phone in Alex's left hand. Thank you. The words were barely a whisper. He had to concentrate now, willing the pressing darkness to part just long enough for one final task. The man once more placed his hand reassuringly on Alex's shoulder, and the darkness parted slightly, just enough for what Alex needed to do. He worked the phone awkwardly with his left hand, gritting his teeth through the pain of broken fingers. Opening a new message, he scrolled down his contacts. G, H, I, J, finally, K. He found her name at last, then began typing out a message. I still think about you every time it rains. He moved his thumb to press send, but that's when Alex's body failed him at last, the phone tumbling out of his grasp. But the man was there to catch it. Moving blindly fast, he snatched the falling phone up and held it carefully to Alex's eyes before pressing send. He held the phone there for Alex to see through his fading vision until at last, message sent confirmed successful delivery. The rain began once more, temperamental as it always is in the Pacific Northwest. Fat, heavy raindrops fell on the scene of a terrible accident, the victim seemingly having died on impact. On his lap, though, lay his phone, and somewhere far away and far below this dark mountainside, a message notification chirped on a distant phone. SCP-4999 manifests to only one person at a time, and only when they are alone. All subjects to date have been in the final stages of a terminal illness, suffering from a life-threatening injury or otherwise on their deathbed. It also appears that all subjects have personalities and lives that could be described as nondescript, insignificant, or otherwise unremarkable. No testing of SCP-4999 has been authorized by the Foundation due to both the difficulty in predicting where it will appear, as well as the fact that observation seems to prevent the anomaly from appearing. There are right. also ethical concerns, since many in the Foundation feel that SCP-4999 is providing an important service to humanity, even if it is only for those on the margins of society, and it is debated whether this should be one anomalous creature that is allowed to continue its existence and its work without interference all right so that was the scp explained version of the story so let's go ahead and we're going to take a look at the vulgan and his version of the story and we're going to go ahead and see how they differ if they differ at all um it's pretty short so it won't take that long good afternoon everyone my name is dr miller and the SCP we're going to be looking at today is SCP-4999. Object Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures. Due to SCP-4999's unwillingness or inability to appear before more than one person at a time, in addition to the subsequent and immediate death of any who witness it firsthand, SCP-4999 is effectively self-containing. Any reports of SCP-4999 manifestations captured by security camera feeds, photographs, or similar are to be investigated, and the media confiscated for analysis. All secondhand witnesses among the civilian populace are to be amnesticized. Okay, so already a little bit of a difference here. Here, it's giving us... Uh a little bit more information saying that this entity can in fact be caught on photographs or on camera. So while he can't be observed physically with your eyes by uh, more than anyone than the person who is experiencing this, apparently he can be caught on camera. So interesting. Description. SCP-4999 is a humanoid entity of unknown composition, visually resembling a middle-aged male. Its physical appearance varies, with its dark suit being the only constant between manifestations. Due to the rarity of recorded SCP-4999 manifestation events and the highly specific circumstances in which they occur, little data concerning its nature or intent 
is available. However, its behavior is consistent across all recorded sightings. SCP-4999 will manifest only in the presence of one solitary human person at a time. All subjects recorded to date have been in terminally poor health, critically injured, or on their deathbeds. Okay. With SCP-4999 appearing nearby and within sight of the individual not more than 20 minutes before their expiration. Alright. SCP-4999 will only appear if the subject is conscious and alone. It will not appear if the subject is comatose, asleep, or unconscious, nor will it appear if they are being cared for by or in the company of or otherwise being directly observed by another person. Upon manifestation, the entity will seat itself directly adjacent to the subject's bed, if such furniture is available. If not, it will remain standing or sit on the floor or ground in whatever configuration will allow it direct physical access to the subject without causing disturbance. Once situated, it will remove a pack of cigarettes from its left inside jacket pocket and offer one to the subject. If the subject accepts, SCP-4999 will place it between their lips, remove one for itself, and light both. If the subject declines, SCP-4999 will light and smoke the cigarette instead. The entity will make physical contact with the subject, typically via holding their hand, placing its hand atop theirs, or resting its hand on their shoulder. SCP-4999 will then remain with the subject, silent and unmoving, until they have passed away. SCP-4999 has not been seen to engage in any other activity or behavior, and demanifests immediately upon the subject's death. The subject's cigarette, however, will remain, providing the only physical evidence of SCP-4999's presence. A little bit more information. to See, this is where you are starting to see the difference between SCP Explained and some of these other channels. While SCP Explained does a better job at presenting this information in more of a story format to to tell a narrative a little bit uh, a little bit more than these other ones, the Vulgan here are giving more hard information. You know, they they tell you that okay, he gets into a comfortable position, whether it's sitting or standing based on available furniture, offers the cigarette, will light it, will physically make contact with a person, the cigarette butt remains even after he disappears. So it's more cold hard facts in these, which I do like because I like knowing as much information as possible about these SCPs, that way I can kind of formulate an idea around them or formulate an, an opinion about them. So we're starting to see the differences here between the, the two types of storytelling, basically. No subject thus far has been seen to recoil from or otherwise resist the entity, nor have any attempted to engage it in conversation, despite multiple instances of subjects acknowledging the entity's presence via eye contact, adjusting posture to reciprocate or facilitate the entity's touch breaking into tears when noticing its presence, or verbally thanking the entity when offered a cigarette. Individuals affected by SCP-4999 share a number of common attributes. Research into identified subjects has indicated that SCP-4999 is more likely to appear if an individual lives alone, is non-religious, is impoverished or homeless, displays a history of mental illness, is a military veteran, has no criminal record, or has never been convicted of a violent crime, has no currently surviving family, is unmarried or otherwise lacks a significant other, has little to no social standing in the community, does not exhibit any record of significant professional or personal accomplishments, has few to no mutually beneficial interpersonal relationships, or exhibits qualities and life history that have rendered the individual nondescript, anonymous, neglected, or otherwise unremarkable or insignificant by the standards of their respective society. No testing involving SCP-4999 has been authorized or attempted, due to available data indicating that observation of a subject precludes its manifestation, as well as ethical concerns. Goddamn ethics committee. <laughs> Discovery. 
SCP-4999 was initially discovered as the result of its emerging status as an urban legend, with footage of an entity appearing on hospital security cameras worldwide being disseminated via the internet and various television programs. A minor disinformation program was put into effect to maintain this public image, and SCP-4999 was officially registered on November 27th, 1998. Okay, so the only physical evidence it leaves behind is the uh, remaining cigarette butt that he smokes while he's with the person. And he can be caught on camera, on tape, in photographs. And it seems like it started to build an urban legend around him. And then eventually the foundation officially registered him as an SCP. Interesting. Okay. Okay. A little bit uh, different than most SCPs where they just rush in and try and contain it or capture it. In the years following SCP-4999's classification, additional research and cross-referencing with accounts of similar phenomena have suggested that while concrete evidence of SCP-4999 appearances has become more commonplace due to the advent of photography and video recording technology in the modern era, writings and artistic depictions of a figure exhibiting similar properties, behavior, and physical resemblance to SCP-4999 exists throughout world history, culture, and mythology, with some accounts being thousands of years old, in some cases predating human civilization. It is not currently understood how pre-modern cultures would have been capable of detecting SCP-4999's presence. Investigation is ongoing. There isn't a lot of SCPs that restore your faith in this universe, but man, this is one of them. But that about does it for today. Thank you for listening, if indeed you still are, and you're all dismissed. Goodbye. Okay, so that was the Vulgans take on it. Now, obviously, the Vulgans take was uh, quite a bit shorter than SCP Explained and was done more in the format of a uh, containment file rather than uh, a story that's being told to you. Now, I will say both of these have their merits. If you're looking for more of a story, more for just pure entertainment, then SCP Explained is probably the way to go on this. If you're looking for cold, hard data facts because you are just curious about what this is, how it functions, things like that, then SCP Explained is not the video you're looking for. So it is interesting to see these two side by side since they are shorter videos and I don't usually do a side by side. Uh, so it is interesting to see their differences. Now, they both did mention pretty much they both covered the, the major points of it, which is how he shows up, when he shows up, to whom he shows up, um, what he does. I will say, to me, the biggest difference between the two, aside from the narrative storytelling aspect, was... There seemed to be one major difference in how they portrayed the character, and that was at the very end of SCP Explains video, where the man attempts to reach for his cell phone to send out a message. The uh, dark figure, if you will, reaches over and grabs the phone and hands it to him, and then even hits the send button for him. Hmm... To me, based on what I heard from the Vulgan, that seems a little bit like embellishment because from my own opinion and from what I've heard, it seems like he really wouldn't do something like that. It feels more like he's simply there to be with you in your final moments. It seems like his entire purpose here is to appear to people in their final moments when they don't have anyone else. Essentially, his purpose is to make sure that no one dies alone, which, hey, very, very commendable. Um, can't really say that I would want to test or attempt to contain um, this particular SCP either. I think he is doing the world 
a favor, essentially, you know, by doing something so compassionate as to be there for those who just don't have anyone else. But yeah, I don't think that he would basically uh, interact like that. I don't, because he does, he goes so far as to never even speak during any of the instances that have been explained to us. He does not speak whatsoever. He does not engage people in conversation. The most he does is make minor physical contact, whether it be holding a hand or touching someone on their shoulder or something like that, and maybe some minor facial expressions. Other than that, he seems to be entirely passive. So it does seem a little out of the ordinary that one of the stories would have him be so proactive as to give someone their phone when they couldn't grab it themselves or to hit send when they couldn't hit send. So that is a little uh, a little iffy in my book. Other than that, about the SCP itself, I think is really interesting. And towards the end here, where they were saying that this, uh, this entity has been known to appear in artwork dating back way, 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 way back that, uh, you know, this entity has been around for a long, long time. The closest thing that I can think of to this, aside from, of course, the traditional angel of death, grim reaper, you know, hooded robe skeleton figure, is Neil Gaiman's version of death, who is closer to this, where um, death appears as something more pleasant, obviously, than a skeletal figure in a robe with a scythe. Um, death appears as a female, but can change its appearance to look like anything. But Neil Gaiman's version is you have a basically a friendly uh, version of death who comes for you in your final moments, much like, much like this guy does. Neil Gaiman's version of death is there to make sure that, you know, she's there for everyone. So that would be the, the big one that's kind of similar, would be Neil Gaiman's version of death, who kind of comes to you, interacts with you a little bit, and then when it's time, helps you move on to the next part. So this is another SCP that is seems benevolent, seems like it has very honorable intentions. If anything, you would call this a positive or a beneficial SCP. Uh, in that regard, I think that's really cool and I like it a lot. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video as much as I have enjoyed making it. Feel free to hit that like button, smash that subscribe button, really helps the channel out. As always, leave a comment down below. Let me know what other SCPs I should be checking out in the future. As always, guys, thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks for watching the video. Take care of yourselves and have a great day.